Hi. Let's Good morning. Good morning. Thanks for being here. <laughs> Thank you all for being here, too. Yeah. How about an uh, uh, introduction? Introduce sure. yourself, and uh, then I'll I'm, start with questions. Yes, I'm Senator Angus McKelvey, and I have the unlucky um, honor, I guess, of being one of the many people who was personally affected by the Lahaina wildfires and been with my community pretty much every day. And it's, uh, I'm honored to be here, but I'm also, it's probably the most challenging, surreal thing I think I've ever experienced in my life. I'm, I'm only my first term as a state senator. Um, I'm hopefully going to get the blessing of the community to go back, but it has been, a, I want to just aloha everybody in the mayor's office and their people because the hard work really falls on them. And so I just want to aloha them. And everything that this, this has probably been the most important conference I've been to this summer. Sorry, guys. We go to a lot of these things. They touch upon the edges. They will not dive into the meat and bone. <laughs> exactly, Jen. <laughs> so, again, thank you for allowing me to use this introduction to mahalo them because the work they're doing is so important. Good morning, my name is Troy Hashimoto and I'm a state senator for Central Maui, so that's the neighboring district to Lahaina. Uh, I was actually, when the fire happened, I was the chair of the housing committee in the house, and so I think that was my response and my responsibility at that point was to really look at some of the housing needs for Maui. Um, you know, I'm actually in the Senate because of the fire, so my predecessor actually resigned from the Senate to take on legal cases, so he's taking on some of the cases of, uh, f on behalf of you know, people that, that lived on Maui, and so he couldn't do both, and so he resigned from the Senate, and I took his place um, in the Senate um, in November of this past year, and um, I then went into the Vice Chair of Housing, so I continue my work in the housing arena and space. Um, I also serve on the money committee that we really oversaw a lot of the, the spending, and I, you know, I, I actually prepared a slide to just kind of give you a taste of what some of the decisions that we had to go through um, as, as we went through this past legislative session. But great to be here. I think Jennifer, I, I know Jennifer, she was introduced through a mutual colleague that we served on a panel once. And you know, I think she's been a great resource in terms of understanding what's next, what's next. I think that's, as, as you all know, that's the hardest thing to predict. Um, and you don't know until you're really in it. And so I think this, that is a key. And I think now we know we have to pay it forward. Um, as, as people are, are trying to understand what they have to go through after a fire. So thank you for, for inviting me. Thank you. So the first question for each of you is, what have been some of the biggest hurdles facing the immediate aftermath of the fires and the long-term rebuild of Maui? He's got a slide presentation, I guess. <laughs> Um, I guess the the question again, sorry, I have fire brain. Um, no, <laughs> biggest hurdles um, in the immediate aftermath and then long-term uh, challenges in rebuilding. I think, as my colleague here will, it's the sticker shock of the reality that the states are going to take the hits to their budgets first. So many people, even me, the feds are here. Biden promised 100%. We're going to be taken care of. We're going to be good. And then all of a sudden you discover that 100% isn't 100%. It's 50%, if it's even reimbursed at all. So now our Ways and Means Chair, a good friend Donovan Delacruz, rightfully so, was in a sheer panic of having to send a memo out to our colleagues to say we're going to be looking at 10% cuts to all state agencies across the entire state of Hawaii. My biggest fear, I guess, in the long-term recovery is how do we ensure that the people of Hawaii support Lahaina and Maui in the canoe that's sinking? Because a BBC reporter told me right after the fire, an embed said, what are you going to do when they all forget about you? And that's why this is so important, because it'll fade, and everybody moves on to the next disaster. But yet, we're here to take care of So for us, it's not only, and I want to thank my colleague for the work that he and the Ways and Means Committee did on being able to generate this kind of financial need, but the biggest thing which was discussed today is going forward is how do we learn from the experiences, the sad experiences of your communities. And that's the reason why on my own dime I went to the Marshall, to the Marshall Fire in Colorado, was to see a peer into the future. And that's where I saw things like underinsurance, contractor fraud, mental illness, all of the things that we in Lahaina are dealing with. So I think that having this community of unfortunate alumni, which we are now a part of, is giving us the tools to be able to look into the future to know what's coming. So that's been the challenges for me. Thank you. Yeah, so we can pull up the slides real quick. I think 
I, I think what I really wanted to do is just kind of outline what the state actually did because you know when we learn from other places it's it's kind of unique what the state did in, in the, the aftermath of the response I think a lot of times the states are there as standby but I, I think mostly because of our governor we, we dove right in and whether that was the right decision or not I think time will tell but I think the first thing that we we really um, you know looked at was housing and the, the state decided to sign a contract with the Red Cross of a $500 million contract to move everyone out of the gyms into hotel rooms. And so when we were looking back of what that cost actually was, we were calculating that it was about $1,000 a day that we were paying for not only the hotel rooms, but the meals and the ancillary services. And at, when, we, when the Ways and Means Committee was looking back to understand what what factored into that cost, it was just really murky. So I, I think we went in, we asked for what, what are the receipts? And we, we, you know, we got a stack of receipts and we, just to go through it and to understand what we were paying for, we weren't really sure. So that's why it was really tough for us to, to get a true figure of was it actually 500 million that we're gonna pay out? Was it more? Because I think at the time we thought it was actually gonna be more and the budget was gonna be blown through. And so I think the lesson for us was you know, you shouldn't go in and sign a contract if you're the state or the county. You should let FEMA take care of it because then they bear the cost. I think why we were so worried is because we had to pay the cash up front and then wait for reimbursement later. And so that was a huge concern that we had. So in addition to that, you know, $500 million contract, we did some other things. So we also, you know, of course, we're, we're working on a global settlement for the, um, the all, all the fire victims, and I think the state is looking to contribute about $800 million to that global settlement, so that's coming. It, it, we have some issues with insurance companies, so we're not sure if that's gonna get sealed but uh, and, and finished, but I think that is the tentative agreement that the state's gonna put forward. We also did um, $65 million for infrastructure rebuild to the county. We did a, uh, a loan to them if they needed to pull on that. Obviously, the county wanted a whole lot more in this first year, but it was a push and pull between the two. Um, you know, I think Mayor Biston did a really good job of trying to convince the legislature, but I think the hard part for the Maui delegation to convince the rest of the legislature was we had this looming $500 million contract. So to convince them that we needed to give them even more money was, was a little bit tough this last session. And then we're putting in $150 million for some housing solutions for, for temporary housing. And so I think there's a few slides on the temporary housing. So if you could go to the next slide. Um, we also, oh, and we also, we also paid for the furniture of a school, for the school, temporary school. So FEMA and the Army Corps put up a temporary school for us. And that was um, done in 95 days. And so that is, was a pretty big feat, but we have to pay for the, um, the, the, the ancillary costs in the furniture. So um, I, I think part of it is when we take a look at the, the long-term strategy for what are we looking for for housing, we, the state has specifically focused in on a long-term housing strategy on state-owned parcels within the burn zone. And so I think we, we're calling it a trifecta project where we had a state-owned apartments building that burnt down, a public housing authority apartments, and a nonprofit. So we're, we're looking at making sure that we can get into the burn zone and start rebuilding um, expeditiously. Next, next slide. Of course, when I talked about the, the state having some big issues, it, it, was, it was tough times going in through these hearings and the county was there, all, all the federal officials were there, our, our, our state um, you know, emergency management folks was, was getting a handle on those costs and that always um, will always be difficult. So next slide. So when we talked about the $150 million in the temporary housing, that, that this is what we're, we're talking about here. So we are proposing $115 million for 450 units. Uh, we, we invested that much, about 40 million is coming from the Hawaii Community Foundation, so philanthropy, so at least the state's not picking up that cost. But that is our temporary housing solution that we're hoping that will last for the next five years. So next slide. So this is what it's supposed to look like in, in concept. So ne next slide. This is what it currently looks like, and just for some context, $40 million was for the actual structures. The rest of the money, guess what that was? That was infrastructure. So that was blasting of all of the rock that was putting in pipes, you know, making sure we had sewer water, electricity. So very, very expensive. I think when, when we go back to the legislature, there will probably be a lot of questions on whether that was the best investment 
but I think we needed to find a state-owned partial, and this is where we went, or the governor just and his team decided this is where we were going to go, and, and that's why it's $115 million for 450 units. So you do the math, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars a unit, probably could do permanent housing in that point, but it's, it's temporary for five years. And why it's temporary is because we're borrowing water from the county to use in this, at this site, and we have to eventually give back that water because they need, to, they need to use that water for the rebuild. Next slide. This is what it looks like the, the, when we put up the units. It's kind of getting there to the other conceptual picture. Uh, next slide. Um, okay, we went through this already, so next slide. We're jumping all around. So, so, and so these are some of the things that we are trying to figure out uh, uh, moving forward. It's, it's that long-term water supply, the long-term sewer supply, because water in West Maui is the biggest issue. So when we were doing that trifecta project that I was talking about, the biggest thing that a lot of people are asking is, how can we go more dense? Because it was low-rise, two, three-story unit. Actually, it's two-story units. So we were asked, can we do, we asked the, the, the county, can we do three stories, four stories, potentially? And their, their, their concern is they only have a certain water allocation. And so they can't give us an answer if we can go more dense because they don't know if they have water. But the people that control the water allocation is actually the state. And the state is trying to figure out how do we figure, how do we get more water allocation to West Maui? And we have to either do source or we have to recycle the water. So those are the big things that we are worried about. We're trying to figure out to get permanent housing rebuilt. It's not an easy thing. It's, it's like the 101 basics that we had before the fire. That's still the problem now, but we still have to figure out a lot of the regional infrastructure. Um, and so I just wanted to kind of give a rundown and overview of some of the problems that we're facing. Um, you know, some of it is county issues, some of it is state issues, but it's an interplay, right? And I think the state of Hawaii is very unique because the state controls a lot of things that other states do not. A, a lot of times the states delegate most of it to the counties or the cities, but in Hawaii there's a lot of control that's still left with the state. Um, so we do have to work really closely with the county to make sure that they can achieve their goals and we can repopulate on that area and build back uh, better. Thank you so much. Uh, you answered a portion of the next question, but um, if you want to deep dive a little bit more, uh, what are the issues uh, you're working on to at the state level to uh, move forward rebuilding and moving forward the, uplifting the um, Lahaina community? In so far as rebuilding goes, rebuilding. Yeah, yeah. I think for us in the state level, it, it, you know, the senator's right. I mean, it's a very weird how to the level the state got involved in this disaster. And I think for me, as we move past, and this is again what's so great about this moving forward is to return to our role is being able to fund and support the county. And they're they're the my friend from the Department of Defense calls it. They're the tip of the spear. They're the ones who are going to be doing, the rebuild is upon them is going to really fall pretty much a lot of it. So supporting the counties through the state budget, I think is gonna be hopefully a really a strong priority for the Maui delegation moving forward. And of course, keeping to everybody, remind them that this disaster came, you know, inflicted upon people who literally went to bed that night, not in a million years thinking that they'd be running for their lives at 11 o'clock at night. Kids in shopping carts being in bicycles, woken up, pulled out of their bed. I mean, those are the things that haunt me every day. And so I think it's trying to put our personal, to our colleagues to say, have grace for Lahaina. This is a long process. It's an expensive process. We need you all to be there for us. But I know this about our community. We will be there for them. And, you know, and th that's the sad thing about this fraternity that keeps growing is there's going to be another disaster in Hawaii. You know, I, and you see it, uh, Makakilo, people from Oahu know that area. That's probably lining up next to be very similar to Lahaina. So I think part of what we're doing through the work that Senator is doing in the Housing Committee and others is to try to implement the best practices of other states to get ahead of it. And I think I'll put my personal plug for vegetation management and control in Oregon. And thank my Oregon friends for being here. We were up there for a conference and they said for every dollar that you guys had put, if you had put Every dollar of that 12 billion that is now being paid out into vegetation management, you wouldn't be looking at a 12 billion dollar tab right now. 
And so I think for us, it's really going to be systematically working very closely with the county and our, our council members to come up with a plan to support them in so far as trying to create a, as we rebuild, to create a town that's safe. And I think that's the experience that all of our friends here from the mainland offer us. So. I think a couple things. I think some of the things that we really need to focus on is making sure that we can get this global settlement to the finish line. I think, you know, the, what was really important about the governor leading that is that the county contribution is only $10 million, right? And, and that, I think, in a lot of discussions, at least for myself, that's really important because they need to save their capital to rebuild and reinvest in the community, right? The state's taking on $800 million, mostly because we had a lot of fallow lands that, and we could po potentially be culpable for, for some of the, the liability, and that's why we're putting in that much. But we also wanted to lead the settlement to make sure that it, it got to the finish line, and so, so showing our contribution, you know, pushed the other entities to, to put in money. But I think we have to now convince our colleagues that we, that 800 million is, the, is what we should be putting in as a state, right? That, that's just a proposal from the governor, and now we have to go figure out how to get the money. So that's gonna be very important to protect the, the, the role of the county and what they're able to do. Of course, they're gonna get federal funds, CDBGDR, but I think their financial stability, in my mind, is, is very critical. Uh, because as, as Senator McKelvey said, they're gonna be at the front end of the recovery and leading the recovery efforts. They have very, very difficult decisions ahead. You know, they, there was a lot of structures on the shoreline yeah, which right. will not be able to be rebuilt just for practical reasons of sea level rise. And we, across the state, we're dealing with structures that are falling into the ocean. So why should we allow these structures to rebuild? And we know maybe in 10 to 15 years, if you do rebuild, you, your property might be in the ocean, right? And so this, and on top of that, I think part of it is we have a global insurance issue. I think a lot of you probably here in the U.S. mainland are seeing insurance costs rise. We particularly are seeing that very, very much so in Hawaii as well, right? It's, it's a statewide issue for us, but in particular, Lahaina is going to be hit very hard because no one wants to insure them, you know, right? So the state's going to have to step in to figure out how to do that. And what I've been very fearful of is that that's what's going to end up slowing down the recovery tremendously because people are going to want to get mortgages and they're not going to be able to get that mortgage because there's no insurance out there. And so we're trying to figure out a solution to that on, on how to approach that correctly. Um, you know, we, we're, we threw, I threw around some ideas of let's subsidize the insurance to last resort. But part of it is the insurance people are telling me you got to be careful because once you start subsidizing, you, you, you know, I think you mess up the private insurance market, which is what you eventually want to get back to because, you know, part of it is sometimes they offer competitive rates because the insurance, the last resort right now, at least in Hawaii, is very, very expensive. So we need to really look at that. I think we have a, a lot going on this coming session. Of course, the last component to that is, I think, our electric company, who you saw how much they're paying. They're, they're you know, they're, they're in the billions of liability to, to, towards this settlement. And I think their company is not even worth that much. And so they're going to come to the legislature to ask us to bail them out. Um, and they're their only electric company on, that serve the main islands. There's, there's one co-op that we have in Hawaii. But we have to figure out if we're, what we're going to do with them as well. So lots of big decisions coming up to, to support the recovery and support our community um, globally. Thank you so much, Senators. You both have lived and breathed um, all of the tragedy of the fire and um, moving your community forward. Were there any lessons learned that you could share with other senators? Well, I actually brought the trauma into the building with me this last session. So I've already shared a lot with my colleagues. <laughs> um, I'm glad I did. You know, I think for us, our mission is going to be to, you know, feel free, Senator, to jump in. I think is to convince, to have our colleagues understand that this recovery is slow it's painful and it's costly. And we need patience and aloha and support and because we're all in this together. And when you're in an island of an island state, it's even more poignant than ever. So I think it's really continuing to educate our colleagues that this is a long journey. We need their support, but with that support, we'll be able to move. And I, already, I mean, I made a, a dire prediction with, you know, with Congresswoman Takuda back in December that this was looking like a 10 to 20 year endeavor. And, I want to mahalo the county again because they're beating the clock. And so really supporting them in that endeavor, I think it's going to be critical when the decisions are made. 
you know, I, I think I have to word this lightly because it's <laughs> it's it's been it's been very interesting with the 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 state the role the state has taken by choice, and I think I have to look at the mayor because he's been the most patient guy out there um, in leading us through this. But I, I think, frankly speaking, amongst friends, I think our governor was was too ambitious. Right? He made too many quick decisions that I think the county could handle, they could figure out, they had a plan, but yet the state just, because of perception and because of you know wanting to look good in the media, we just kind of took over. And without oversight, because it's under emergency proclamations, and so for us in the legislature, it was very, very difficult for oversight, right? Because the governor's doing, he's spending, he's doing what he wants, and now we're looking back and we're saying, was that the correct decisions that were made fiscally, logistically, right, for the future. I, I think even this, this, this 450 unit temporary housing that the state is leading, you know, I was talking to the county guys, and it's great to have them all here because we can talk very candidly, right, about things that happen. And, and they're, they're thinking about repopulation, right, and how that connects with this temporary housing that we're doing. And I think the way that the state did it, it may not really flow into the repopulation, right? And so I think part of it is, you know, you need to make sure that you know your role in these, these disasters. And sometimes you gotta trust the people that they know what they're doing, they know their community best. Um, and, and it's hard because I think there's egos involved, there's people who wanna be up front and they want to, they wanna look like they're leading, but I think I wanna caution that, right, at, at certain times. You have to trust people. I think that's, that's that they know what they're doing, that they know their community the best. And I, I think from a state perspective, that's what I've really taken away from this. And that's why I say the mayor's been patient because I know he just wants to go out on the media and, and you know and tell tell people what he thinks, but he has been a soldier and he has um, kept his cool and, and Josiah too, um, and you know I've been very impressed with with these two. Great, thank you so much. Time for one more question. Are we good? Oh, look at that! So lovely. Thank thank you. Senators, I a pop quiz here because Jennifer gave me three questions and we did good on time. Uh, what kept you individually moving forward as elected officials during um, the fires, the immensity of the need? Like, what keeps you going? Having to every day be shoulder to shoulder with the people that are being affected. And they know you're a senator. They come rolling up to you. They don't care. Government is government, right? Hey, what? they come rolling up to me. I'm getting kicked out of the hotel. I got no place to go. Help me. My office is getting into this literally triaging of individual cases. And I be, and you know what? I would not trade that experience for the world because you only through the depths of suffering do you really get to know the people that you work for. And, you know, and I think that's what drives me every day is nobody can get left behind. And you know, if I drop dead in this job, it will be to end the diaspora effect, which seems to affect all communities, to bring people home back to Lahaina so they can rebuild their community. The way they, and quite frankly, I think with a lot of disasters, and it magnifies the problems, which the Senator brought up, that were existing before. It puts them in a hyper acceleration. Our housing situation was very well known. Every election, housing, housing, housing. Now it's an overdrive because we've lost 80% of the people, as, a, as a, I think Josiah said yesterday, were renters, including me. You know, and that's why when we rebuild in the district, some of the bills we passed to give the counties the ability to do ADUs, adaptive reuse, hopefully as we rebuild, we can bring these concepts in so we can provide the housing that was missing before the disaster. I think the one thing I want to say, because my Senate president would probably kick my butt if I don't say it, is that there has to be the work of this group, hopefully, and really pressed on the federal government, there has to be a pathway to permanency through disasters. All of our efforts were trying to create, turn something that was temporary into permanent. Our, the housing project that the Senator talked about is important because Native Hawaiian beneficiaries of whom are on a waiting list a mile long could potentially utilize some of these resources while they're on the waiting list to get their housing. So our desire has been, how do we create a pathway to permanency? How do we rebuild what was lost permanently back with the help of the federal government. I think for us, for me, the frustration is that they won't, and I think his frustration 
is there's no investment into permanency. It's like, we're going to build something temporary, then we're going to tear it out. And we got to have a pathway to permanency. Why won't we work with HUD? Why can't we do something? And I think our federal delegation, Congresswoman Takuda, especially I mean, sees that point. So hopefully through the work this group is doing and our work, we can make the changes. And I think already changes are being made to FEMA because of the blind fire disaster. That while it won't help our families and our neighbors now, the next disaster, I think it will put people in a better position to get the help they need quicker. I think we have a growing crisis in Hawaii, right? We have more, there's more people leaving Hawaii than, than you know, being born and wanting to stay. And it's, it's, it was happening before the fire, and it's just been accelerated, especially on Maui after the fire. And that, to me, is really, really heartbreaking because the people that you grew up with, they don't see a future on Maui because there's, there, you know, I think they, they look at the housing prices and it's skyrocketing, right? It's, even now, it's, it's going up, even, even after the fire. And, and I think it's going to be very, very expensive for people to rebuild and figure out a life after the fire. And so I think that, and that's why I've always focused on the housing space, even before the fires, because if we can figure out housing, at least we have a shot at keeping our local people on Maui and in Hawaii. And, you know, I think that is what, why we have to focus so much on the housing situation on Maui, but it's, it's complicated because even before the fire it was complicated, we, we couldn't build much in West Maui. That was the least, least um, attractive place to build, um, but now we have to do it. We have no other choice. If we, have, if we want to keep these people on Maui, we're going to have to do it. And so, you know, I think we have a lot of challenges moving forward. And it, it's figuring out the strategy of how we're going to approach it. And I think once you get that strategy, you have to figure out how do we get it to implementation. And so I think a lot of it is interplay. I think the state has some strategies. The county has some strategies. And we have to figure out how to get that all into a lineup to make sure that we can execute. Because if we don't execute, the consequences will be dire. Right? We won't have an economic base. We won't have a future for our young people. Um, so there's high stakes. There was already high stakes, but the stakes now are even higher. And so, you know, I think I will continue to focus on that. I think the, the county knows all, all of this. I think the mayor is very focused on repopulation quickly because of that fact. Um, and so we, we want to make sure that the state supports that effort and we, we bring in our resources and knowledge of how to rebuild on state property and using state resources to complement what they're doing with their CDGVR DR funds. Um, and so I think we, we got to stay motivated because if not, we're, we're going to lose a whole lot of people, which we already are, but we need to stop that bleeding as quickly as possible. Great. Thank you so much. And I think it would be um, a great opportunity to tap into the resources that your office has had in immediately after the fires and then now. What type of casework constituent services did you deliver for your community that other senators uh, could be prepared for? Well, we, we triaged. I mean, my office, I don't want to give them a props. I mean, staff never gets recognized for the work they do, but the work they do is so important. And my, my, my people, there was so much of outpouring. There was this huge spur of the moment drive. We had trucks from Waimanalo pouring into the Capitol. We had the whole rotunda, if you've seen the Hawaii State Capitol, full of donations that came literally pouring in within hours when people found out and saw the footage and everything. And, you know, so that, that to me is like, you know, I tried, to, our office of working with our community and members within every, and a lot of it dealt with the feds, right? And with the assistance programs and such, but, you know, I blessed my staff and thanked them because just having somebody to, to freak out on would meant a lot to people, right? To call up, call Wendy up and Beth and say, you know, and, and tell their troubles and cry. I, I, I even joked, I went to Long's Drugs and bought tissues for my staff because we were running out. But I think because of that, you know, I think hopefully our colleagues, you know, will see that that's the most important thing in the disaster is to create that, to keep your that personal touch with people, to keep some kind of mechanism of hope. Hey, you're not alone, we get it. And I think my colleagues already got that. Or they really do. And, you know, I want to give props to Senator De La Cruz as the chair of the Ways and Means Committee because he came rolling into my office about the state housing. And he goes, we got to, I don't, I don't trust the Gov's numbers, 
We got to make this work. I am not going to sit here and watch on August 8th people whose hopes have been raised to be dashed because there's nothing there. And I think that's, that to me was so awesome because that kind of personal care from our colleagues, if we can sustain that, I think we'll be able to move forward through this from our level. I think it's just knowing what resources you have to provide. I, I think there's going to be a lot of questions. Um, there's going to be a lot of, I think, venting. That, that, that's, that's the biggest thing that you know you, you, people are calling uh, because they're frustrated. Government to them is government. I think at, at that point, the county was overwhelmed, so they start calling the state, and so you have to be able to provide. Right? I think my, a lot of my office's dealings with, was, with constituents who are absorbing all of these people from, from West Maui to, to, to be temporary housing um, because they're family, they were friends. Right? Well, what do they do with the schools now because all the schools were closed down? Uh, and so I think just being able to, to, to rapid respond, having all the correct information, because things were changing very, very quickly um, at the time. And I think there was, at a certain point, there was an information, I think, that we didn't have all the information in one place, but you know, I give the county props. They, they quickly figured out how to get that information out. They even started doing radio messages. And so I think that was solved, but it's, it's those, those first 48 hours, 72 hours that are the toughest because that's where there's so much confusion. You don't know what is correct, what is not, what, and especially with social media. Social media is going to be your biggest enemy because everybody thinks they're a reporter and knows everything and, is, and people are reading it and you're like, no, that's not true, right? Yeah. And so it's establishing those sources that can be trusted and making sure that you're proactive, that if you're a trusted source like a senator or the county, that you're pushing out that info proactively. Because if not, other people are going to find information from other people that are not correct. And so I think communication is key. I think it's, it's, once it's established, it's fine. But it, again, it's the, the, those first couple of days that it's, it's critical to, to make sure that you're ready to go. Thank you so much. And thank you for sharing um, your wisdom and knowledge.